ഗുഡ് ഈവനിങ് വെൽക്കം ടു ഡേ ട്വൻറ്റി ടു ഓഫ് റീഡിംഗ് ചലഞ്ച് ചാപ്റ്റർ ഫൈവ് ദിസ് ഈസ് റാദർ ഇൻ ഡിസ്ക്രീറ്റ് ബട്ട് ഇറ്റ്സ് സോ ഗുഡ് ഇറ്റ്സ് ആൻ ഓഫുൾ ടെംപ്റ്റേഷൻ ടു ടെൽ ദ സ്റ്റോറി സെഡ് ബ്രോൺസ്കി ലുക്കിംഗ് ആൻഡ് ഹെവ് വിത്ത് ഹീസ് ലാഫിംഗ് ഹൈസ് ഐ എം നോട്ട് ഗോയിങ് ടു മെൻഷൻ എനി നെയിംസ് ബട്ട് ഐ ഷാൾ ഗേസ് സോ മച്ച് ദ ബെറ്റർ വെൽ ലിസൺ ടു ഫെസ്റ്റീവ് യങ് മെൻ വെർ ഡ്രൈവിംഗ് ഓഫീസേഴ്സ് ഓഫ് ദിയർ റെജിമെൻറ്റ് ഓഫ് കോഴ്സ് I didn't say they were officers. Two young men who had been lonely. Who had been lonely. In other words, reggae. Possibly, they were driving on their way to dinner with a friend in the most festive state of mind. And they beheld a pretty woman in a hired sludge. She overtakes them, looks around at them. And so they fancy anyway, nods to them and laughs. They, of course, follow her. They gallop at full speed. To their amazement, the fair one alights at the entrance of the very house to which they were going. The fair one darts upstairs to the top story. They get a glimpse of red lips under a short veil and exquisite little feet. You describe it with such feeling that I fancy you must be one of the two. And after what you said just now, will the young man go into, into their comrades? He was giving a farewell dinner. there they certainly did drink a little too much as one always does at farewell dinners and at dinners and at dinner they incur who lives at the top in that house no one knows only their host valet in answer to in answer to their inquiry whether any young ladies are living on the floor top floor answered that there were a great many of them about them after dinner the two young men go into their host study and write a letter to the unknown fair one they compose an ardent epistle epistle a declaration in fact and they carry the letter upstairs themselves so as to elucidate that whatever might appear not perfectly intelligible in the letter why are you telling me those horrible stories well there a maid servant opens the door they hand they hand her they hand her the letter and assure the maid that they are both so in love that they'll die on the spot at the door the maid stupefied stupefied carries in their messages all at once a gentleman appears with the whiskers like sausages as red as a lobster announces that there is no one living in that flat except his wife and sends them both about their business how do you know he had whiskers like sausages as you say oh you shall hear i've just been to make peace between them well and what then that's the most interesting part of the story it appears that it's a happy couple a government clerk and his lady the government clerk lodges a complaint and i became a mediator and such a mediator i assure you telegraph couldn't hold a candle to me why where was the difficulty ah uh, you shall hear we apologize in due form we are in despair despair we entreat forgiveness for the unfortunate misunderstanding the government clerk with the sausages begins to melt but he too decides to express his sentiments and as soon as ever he begins to express them he begins to get hot and say nasty things and again i am obliged to trot out all my diplomatic talents i allowed that their conduct was bad but i urged him to take into consideration their needlessness their youth then to the young man they had only just been launching together you understand they are they regret it deeply and beg you to overlook their misbehavior the government clerk was soft and once more i consent count and i am ready to overlook it but you perceive that my wife my wife is a, a respectable woman has been exposed to the persecution persecution and insults and a eff- friendly of young upstarts countrails and you must understand the young upstarts are present all the while and i have to keep the peace between them again i call out all my diplomacy and again as soon as the thing was about at an end our friend the government clerk gets hot and red and his sausages stand on end with wrath wrath and once more i low and out into diplomatic wiles ah he must tell you this story said betsy laughing to a lady who came into her box he has been making me laugh laugh so well born a chance she added giving ronsky one finger of the hand in which she held her fan and with a shrug of her shoulders she twitched down the bodice of her gown that he had 
that had walked up so as to be dwelly naked as she moved forward towards the footlight into the light of the gas and the sight of our eyes. Bronsky drove to the French theatre, where he really had to see the colonel of his regiment, who never missed a single performance there. He wanted to see him to report on the result of his mediation, which had occupied and amused him for the last three days. Petritsky, whom he liked, was implicated in the affair, and the other culprit was a capital fellow and first-rate comrade who had lately joined the regiment, the young prince Kedro. And what was most important, the interest of the regiment were involved in it too. Both the young men were in Tronsky's company. The colonel of the regiment was waited upon by the government clerk, Venden, with a complaint against the officer, who had insulted his wife. His young wife, so Venden told the story. He had been married half a year, was at church with her mother, and suddenly overcome by indisposition. Arising from her interesting condition, she could not remain standing. She drove home in the first sledge, a smart-looking one she came across. On the spot, the dry officer set off in pursuit of her. She was alarmed and feeling still more unwell, ran up the staircase home. When then himself on turning from his office, heard a ring at their bell and voices, went out and seeing the intoxicated officers with a letter. He had turned them out. He asked for exemplary punishment. Yes, it's all very well, said the colonel to Bronsky, whom he had invited to come and see him. Petritsky is becoming impossible. Not a week goes by without some scandal. This government clerk won't let it drop. He'll go on with the thing. Bronsky saw all the tankless, tanglessness of the business and that there could be no question of a dwell in it. That everything must be done to soften the government clerk and hush the matter up. The colonel had called in Bronsky just because he knew him to be an honorable and intelligent man and more than all, a man who cared for the honor of the regiment. They talked it over and decided that Petritsky and Kedro must go with Bronsky to the vendance to apologize. The colonel and Bronsky were both fully aware that Bronsky's name and rank would be sure to contribute, contribute greatly to the softening of the injured husband's feeling. And these two influences were not in fact without effect, though the result remained as Bronsky had described uncertain. On reaching the French theatre, Bronsky retired to the foyer with the colonel and reported to him his success or non-success. The colonel, thinking it all over, made up his mind not to pursue the matter further, but then, for his own satisfaction, proceeded to cross-examine Bronsky about his interview and it was a long while before he could restrain his laughter. As Bronsky described how the government clerk, after subsidizing for a while, would defin- suddenly flare up again, as he recalled the details and how Bronsky, at the last half word of consolation, skillfully maneuvered at retreat, showing Petritsky out before him. It's a disgraceful story, but killing. Kedro really can't fight the gentleman. Was he so awful hot? He commented, laughing. But what do you say to Clara today? She's marvelous, he went on, speaking of a new French actress. However, often you see her, every day she's different. It's only the French who can do that. Thanks for the day. We'll see tomorrow.